Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the purification as well as the isolation of the product from the overexpressed cells. In this series, in the previous lecture, we have discussed about the basic principle of separation as well as we have discussed about the principle of column chromatography and then subsequently we have discussed about the chromatography system as well as the different components of chromatography system, their influence on to the overall uh, purification uh, efficiency as well as the purification uh, folds. And, and now in this lecture we are going to discuss about the different types of chromatography techniques. So, in this series before we get into the details of the chromatography techniques or chromatography approaches what you can use to purify the proteins, let us see what are the different properties are present in the protein molecules. So, you can imagine that this is a three dimensional protein. So, protein is made up of with the amino acid and the amino acids are, so there are 20 different types of amino acids which are present in the protein and these 20 different types of amino acids are of diversified in nature. Some are polar amino acids, some are non-polar amino acids, some are hydrophobic amino acids, some are uh, basic amino acids and some are acidic amino acids. So, because the protein is having the 20 different types of amino acids and these amino acids are giving different types of features into a protein solutions and according to these amino acids, the protein is also getting folded into a different three dimensional conformations. So, as a result, one protein is acquiring entirely different properties from the different proteins the, which is completely been controlled by the amino acid sequences. So, what are the different properties which can be exploited in a chromatography? A protein could have the charge. So, protein could have the negative charges which means if ha it has the acidic amino acid it could have the negative charges. If it has a basic amino acid it could be a positive charge. So, charge could be positive or charge could be negative. Not only the charge but the distribution of these charges onto the protein is also may vary from the two different proteins and accordingly their efficiency for the matrix or their distribution for the matrix is also could be different. So, the charge is one of the properties which can be exploited for chromatography. The other parameter is the hydrophobicity. So, the protein may have the hydrophobic as well as the non-polar amino acids and these non-polar or hydrophobic amino acids are mostly being present inside the protein, but these hydrophobic uh, amino acids can be exploited for chromatography so that this protein will go and uh, distribute towards the matrix which contains the hydrophobic uh, linkers and as a result you can actually be able to purify the proteins. Now, the proteins are acquiring the three dimensional conformations and based on the amino acid compositions, the protein could have the uh, smaller surface area or protein could have the larger surface area which means the ball, the three dimensional ball what you see could be of smaller diameter or the pro or the three dimensional ball what you see is of a larger diameter. So, depending on the diameter, the surface area is also going to be different and that is also the criteria of exploiting 
during the chromatography. Now, the fourth is the affinity parameter because the protein may have different types of uh, charges, different types of groups which are present and these combination of charge, herdobobic uh, patches may actually acquiring a affinity for a certain biomolecules and that actually is a criteria can be used to purify the protein. One of the classical example is the single standard DNA binding protein or helicases. The single standard DNA binding protein is actually binding to the nucleotides when the DNA is going through the process of replications. So, if you remember, if the DNA is preparing themselves for the replications, the DNA is getting unwind and then it is going to be separated into the two strands and these two strands are then being coated by the single standard DNA binding protein. So, that the DNA template is will freely available for the primer to come and sit and that is how it is actually going to synthesize the new strand. So, the single standard DNA binding protein has the charge distribution and as well as the other kind of amino acid distribution in such a way that it has a very, very high specificity for the DNA. And that is why if you use the DNA as a uh, ligand or DNA as a molecule, you could be able to purify the single standard DNA binding protein from the crude lysate. This is just an example, one example. There are many other examples where the molecules may have a very specific affinity for uh, the some of the ligands. For example, so, there are so many de de dehydrogenases which have a affinity for NADH or NADPH and in those cases you can use these ligands to purify the proteins. So, according to the different properties such as charge, hydrophobicity, surface area and affinity, the people have devised different types of chromatography techniques. For the charge, people are using the ion exchange chromatography. For hydrophobic uh, patches, people are using the hydrophobic interaction chromatography or HIC. Uh, similarly, for surface area, people are using the gel filtration chromatography or gel permeation chromatography. And for affinity chromatography, depending on the protein and its uh, affinity parameters, you can use the affinity chromatography. So, in today's lecture, we are going to start our discussion about the ion exchange chromatography. So, ion exchange chromatography, as the name suggests, it is actually going to work with the positive or the negative charges present on the protein. The basic principle of this protein is that this chromatography distribute the analyte molecule as per the charge and their affinity towards the opposite, a positively charged matrix, which means if the protein is positively charged, it may have the affinity for negatively charged matrix and vice versa. The analyte bounds to the matrix are exchanged with a competitive counter ion to elute. The interaction between the matrix and analyte is determined by the net charge, ionic strength and the pH of the buffer. Now, let us see how the ion exchange chromatography is separating the two molecules or separating the, the proteins of different charges. So, in this example, we have taken the three proteins, uh, the protein which is uh, having uh, M, M plus, M minus and M2 minus. So, you have a complex mixture of the proteins which are M, M plus, M minus and M2 minus and then you have loaded this onto a positively charged matrix. So, you have a matrix which is positively charged on which you have loaded M which is neutral molecules, M2 minus which is uh, two negative charges, M minus which is M uh, one neg neg negative charge and M plus which is a one positive charge. So, what will happen while these molecule will go through with the column they will interact with the charge or the positively charged groups which are present on the matrix and what will happen is that because the positive charge is always having a uh, affinity for the negative charge, the, the M neutral is not going to bind to the matrix. M 
plus is actually having the same charge. So, it is going to repel from the matrix. So, that also is not going to bind the matrix. What it will going to bind is actually the M2 minus as well as the M minus and the affinity for M2 minus is going to be more compared to the M minus. Now, once they are bind, then you can wash this column and remove the M neutral as well as the M plus and now you can actually put the another negatively charged competitive ion and that actually is going to remove the M minus before M minus first and M2 minus on the second occasion. So, that is how it is actually going to separate the complex mixture which contains the proteins of different charges. Uh, so, the neutral or the positively charged analyte will not going to bind to the matrix whereas, the negatively charged analyte will bind and as per their relative charges and the needed the higher concentration of counter ion to elute from the matrix which means the M2 minus is having the higher affinity for the matrix compared to the M minus and as a result when you elute with the counter ion you will have to supply the higher concentration of the counter ion to elute the M2 minus compared to the M minus. The matrix used in the ion exchange chromatography is ionized for reversible bound ion to the matrix. The ion present on the matrix participate in the reversible exchange process. Hence, there are two different types of ion exchange chromatography. One is called cation exchange chromatography. In cation exchange chromatography, matrix has a negatively charged functional group with a affinity towards positively charged molecules. Uh, the positively charged analyte replaces the reversibly bound cation and binds to the matrix. In the presence of a strong cation such as sodium in the mobile phase, the matrix bound positively charged analyte is replaced with the elution of analyte. The popular cation exchangers are as follows. So, you can have the carboxymethyl which is uh, CH2COOH, you have the sp sephiros you can have the sulfonate, but these all these three are the cation exchanger whereas, the other possibility is the anion exchanger and in the case of anion exchanger it is going to be a positively charged functional group which is having the affinity for the negatively charged groups. Now, in a anion exchange chromatography, in anion exchange chromatography the matrix has a positively charged functional group with the affinity towards the negatively charged molecules. The negatively charged analyte replaces the reversibly bound anion and bind to the matrix. In the presence of a strong anion such as the chloride in the mobile phase, the matrix bound negatively charged analyte is replaced with the elution of analyte. The popular anion exchanger is diisephoros or the quaternary amine or the monocube. So, these are the examples of anion exchanger. So, these are just a simple example to explain you about the ligands which are being present onto the anion exchanger or the cation exchanger. How these two techniques are performing the chromatography and making a separation is being given in this figure. So, in the case of cation exchange chromatography, you have the matrix which is actually having the negatively charged groups and these negatively charged groups are having the bound sodium. So, once you add a protein which is positively charged, the protein is going to replace the sodium and it is going to bind to your beads. So, in the first uh, step, the when you add the protein to the bead, it is going to go and bind. So, in this, this is your binding step. Now, once the binding is over, then you can wash and by when you wash, what will happen is the proteins which are actually going to bind the, to these beads 
because of the non specific interaction such as the because the beads these beads are made up of of agarose or sapphorose or some other kind of material these beads are also having some affinity or non specific affinity for the proteins so even if you wash these beads or once this column with a washing buffer these uh, protein molecules are going to be removed which are not interacting with the functional group present on the beads now you have the beads the functional group and the protein is bound to that particular functional group now what you are going to do is you are going to do exactly the same the reversal now what you do is you will supply the nacl or the sodium now once you add the sodium it is actually going to replace the protein and it will bind to your functional group but the amount of sodium which is required to replace the protein bound to the matrix beads is going to be different for different proteins for example in if you remember in our previous example m2 minus is having the two uh, negative charges so it is actually going to bind very strongly to the beads compared to m2 m m1 minus so because of that it may require the higher concentration of the your elution sample or your salt compared to this in anion exchange chromatography exactly the reverse the beads then you have the positively charged functional group which is been protected by the chloride which is present in the buffer once you add the protein the protein is going to replace the chloride and it will going to bind now you at this stage you are going to do so this is your binding stage now at this stage you can do a washing just like as we discussed for the cation exchange once you do the washing it is going to remove the non specific molecules afterwards you will put a competitive anion anions and that competitive anion is going to replace the protein and this replacement is also going to be in correlation to the amount of negative charge present on that particular protein and its affinity for the matrix so by this the cation or the anion exchanger can be used for a protein to purify with the help of the negative or the positive charge ions on present on the cells of uh, present present on the proteins but the question comes under what condition you will use an ion exchanger or under what condition you will use the cation exchanger chromatography so how you will select the matrix in the ion exchange chromatography the one of the crucial parameter is the pi values and the net charge you know that every protein has the different types of amino acids and these amino acids are collectively providing the negative or the positive charges so the protein is having the positive charges as well as the negative charges but if you titrate these proteins at different ph what will happen is that these negative charges or the positive charges are going to be neutralized by the ions which are present in the buffers at different ph and as a result you will achieve a ph at which the net negative charge net charge on to your protein is going to be zero and this ph at which your P protein is going to show you a net net uh, zero charge that ph is called as the isoelectric point or the pi values and that pi value is going to allow you to calculate the net charge of uh, present on the protein at any ph the information of a pi will allow you to calculate the net charge at a particular ph on a protein a cation exchanger cation exchange chromatography can be used with the below of the pi so the thumb rule is that if you go below to the pi value you can be able to use the cation exchange chromatography if you go above to the pi values you will be able to use the anion exchange chromatography for practical purposes how much we should go down and how much we should go up 
there is no such rule or such formula but what people have realized by their experiences that you uh, you are definitely have to use the at least 2 unit in pH to go down or 2 unit of pH to go up which means if you have a protein whose pi value is 7.4 this means if you would like to use the cation exchange chromatography, you have to perform the cation exchange chromatography at 5.4. But if you would like to use the anion exchange chromatography, you have to use the pH which is 9.4, which means you have to bring the two unit differences from the pi values. Why the two unit of pi difference, why the two unit of pH is required because the, what people have realized from their experiences that this much difference is good enough to impart the sufficient charge onto the protein and that actually will allow them to bind to the ligands or the positive or the negatively charged ligands present onto the matrix. If you go lower to that, it will still bind, but then the affinity would be so low that as soon as you will put the washing buffer, the protein will come out. So that is why this is the thumb rule that you use the two pH differences either onto the lower side or to the upper side. Now the second criteria is the structural stability. You know that the protein is three dimensionally three dimensional structures and the three dimensional structure of a protein is maintained by the electrostatic and van der Waal interaction between the charge amino acid. For example, the arginine is making a group uh, making an interaction with the glutamic acid or some kind of salt bridge interactions or sometimes the arginine is making the van der Waal or hydrogen bonding interaction and most of these interactions are ionic in nature. So, the you have the uh, uh, wonder wall interaction between the charge amino acid, you have the pi pi interaction between the hydrophobic side chain of a amino acid. So, as a result the protein structure is stable in a very narrow range around its pi and a large deviation from it may affect its three dimensional structure and you know that the three dimensional structure or the integrity of the three dimensional structure of a protein is very important for its enzymatic activity or its functional activity. So, that is why you have to ensure that the whatever the changes you do in terms of the pH or buffer to run the cation or the anion exchange chromatography, you could be able to, you should not destroy the three dimensional structures. Now, the third is the enzymatic activity. In case you are purifying the enzyme, then the similar to structural stability, the enzymes are active in a very narrow range of pH and this range should be considered for choosing an ion exchange chromatography. So, as it is given, if you go to lower to the pi values, you will be able to use the cation exchange chromatography. If you go above to the pi values, you will be able to use the anion exchange chromatography. Now, the question comes how you could be able to calculate the pi of a protein because that is very important if you would like to start using the uh, anion or the cation exchange chromatography. Before the genomic era started or before people were not having the, uh, the sequence information of the particular protein both in terms of the amino acid sequence as well as the gene sequences, people were going with the trial error methods when they were trying to use the ion exchange chromatography. What they are going to do is suppose they use the cation exchange chromatography, so they will use the cation exchange chromatography. Once you do the cation exchange chromatography and you will load your lysate, you are going to get two fractions. One, you are going to get the bead bound fraction or you are going to get the flow through. Now, since the genomic error was not there, what they will do is and suppose you are uh, purifying a enzymatic activity, what they were doing is they were doing the activity in both of these fractions. Now, and they have they have already run the cation exchange chromatography okay so and suppose they have done the cation exchange chromatography at ph 7.4 that is a standard thing because 7.4 is a physiological ph so once they do the cation exchange chromatography at 7.4 
either the protein will be present in, in the matrix bound phase or it will be present in the flow through phase which means it is not going to bind to the matrix. Now they will analyze these two fractions for activity. Suppose they got the protein in this fraction, then they will realize that the protein is having a pi values which is closer to 8 or 9 because if you remember you for cation exchange chromatography you have to go lower to the pi values. But suppose they got the protein into the flow through which means at 7.4 the protein is not binding into the cation exchange chromatography. Then what they do is at 7.4 itself they will going to try the anion exchange chromatography and in that process the protein will go and bind to the anion exchange chromatography. But this kind of try error method was uh, people were doing when they were not having any information about the pi values, they were not having any information about the amino acid sequences and they were not having any information about the genomic sequences. But nowadays you have the all different types of approaches so that you should not go by the trial error method. You can pres very precisely be able to use cation exchange chromatography or anion exchange chromatography by simply calculating the pi values. And there are three approaches by which you could be able to calculate the pi values. The so, approach number one is a theoretical calculations. So, you know that the effective charge of a protein is being decided by the charge provided by the individual amino acids. So, what you can do is you can take the individual amino acids and their pK values and that information can be used to calculate the pH as well as the charge onto the protein at particular pH. And by doing so, you could be able to calculate at which pH the protein is going to have the net charge, net charge 0 and that would be the pi values. So, the theoretical calculation is also going to give you a rough idea of the pi values. It may not be very precise, but it will actually good enough to run the cation exchange chromatography or the anion exchange chromatography. The second source is the web source. So, there are multiple web sources people are using. One of the example which I have shown is the Expassy websites. So, the link is given here. You can use this to calculate the pi values as well as the molecular weight of the protein. What you are supposed to do is you in this block you will provide the amino acid sequence of the protein and, uh, and then you ask the computer or uh, uh, then you ask the web servers to calculate the pi as well as the molecular weight. As soon as you click this button it will actually going to give you the pi values and it the web source the the expasis web source is actually doing the same thing it is taking the uh, pk values uh, of the individual amino acid the uh, the sequence what you have put and it is actually just calculating and putting those values making the average and calculating the pi values now the third method is the experimental method or experimental way of calculating the pi values you know that the protein is soluble in a buffer simply because it has some positive charges and some negative charges and in those positive and negative charges are allowing the protein to interact with the molecules of the buffer and because of that the protein will remain into the uh, solutions. But at the pi value when the net positive or negative charge or net charge is going to be 0 the protein is going to be the least soluble and because of that the protein will start going to precipitate. So, when the protein will precipitate or it will make the precipitate it is actually going to give you a very high scattering. Now, scattering is something which can be calculated by taking an absorbance at 660 nanometer. If you remember when we were discussing about the, the counting of bacteria, we were also uh, we have discussed this method of uh, counting the bacteria simply by taking an absorbance at 660 nanometer that actually is actually uh, measuring the scattering events instead of the absorbance events. So, that will give you the scattering and if you see 
So, what you can do is you take the protein solutions, incubate the protein solution with different pH and then you take the scattering of these, uh, then you record the scattering. As soon as the protein will start coming out from the solution, it will going to form the particles which means it is not going to be soluble and that is how it is actually going to give you more and more scattering and the pH at which the scattering is going to be highest that is the PI values and that is how you can actually be able to calculate very precisely the PI values. Alternate method of calculating the PI is that if you use the isoelectric focusing strips and you load your protein that also actually can give you the PI value because at the, at the PI value it is not going to migrate. So, this is all about calculating the PI. Once you have calculated the PI, you could be able to choose the pH at which you can you would like to operate or you would like to run the cation or the anion exchange chromatography. Now, let us discuss how to perform this particular chromatography for a crude mixture lysate or crude mixture of the proteins. So, this is the uh, uh, chromatography system and this is the pattern we, you will get when you will perform the chromatography uh, and exchange chromatography. In the first uh, first uh, step, what you are going to do is first you add the column material as well as the stationary phase. So, the first is that you prepare your column. The column material should be chemically inert to avoid destruction of biological samples. So, that is very important that whatever the material or whatever the matrix you take that should not react with the uh, proteins. It should allow the free uh, flow of the liquid with the minimum clogging which means the, the column what you prepare should not uh, should allow the protein should allow the running of the buffer. And it should be able to capable of to stand the back pressure and it should not compress or expand during the operation. Which means if you are taking a column and you are putting the beads, these beads should withstand some pressure so that it should not shrink or it should not expand. Because if they shrink or if they expand, they are actually going to change the overall arrangement of the beads within the column and that actually is going to destroy the packing and that may eventually affect the purification. The other thing is that the chemical or the molecule material whatever you use it should be chemically inert so that it should not react with the protein. If it react with the protein, the protein will get modified and the protein will go and bind to these beads and then it, they will not come out when you put the reversible com competitive anion, anion or cations. Now, the first uh, you are going to prepare the column. Once the column is ready, then you load your sample. So, uh, then you, you then you will equilibrate the column, equilibrate the column with the mobile phase. Mobile phase is nothing but the buffer. So, you have to choose the buffer as well as the pH at which you would like to perform the cation or the anion exchange chromatography. So, the ionic strength and the pH are the crucial parameter to influence the property of the mobile phase. Which means, if you use the high, high ionic strength of the buffer, it may withstand the minute changes of the pH. Now, the third step is uh, you prepare the sample, sample you prepare the sample and the sample is prepared in the mobile phase and it should be free of the suspended particle to avoid clogging of the column. So, when you prepare the sample, you prepare the sample into the mobile phase so that there should be no change in pH and the mobile phase should not have any particulate matter so that it should not clog the column. So, otherwise it will not allow the run of the buffer. Uh, and then you can use the injection, uh, injection wall and uh, to inject the samples. Then the fourth step is once the column will go and once the protein will go and bind to the uh, column, then you can actually use the elution. There are many ways to elute uh, analyte from the ion in from the ion exchange column. One is the stepwise gradient. The second is the continuous gradient. So stepwise gradient means 
that you will elute the column at a very very discrete steps. For example, 10 millimolar NaCl, uh, 20 millimolar NaCl. So those, those are called as step gradient. Whereas in the linear gradient, you are going to make a gradient of the NaCl starting from 0 molar to 1 molar. So that actually is a linear gradient and that will allow, that actually will uh, allow you to optimize at what uh, P, uh, NaCl concentration you can get the protein of your interest. Once the elution is over, then you are going to do the column regeneration because after the purification is over, you have to ensure that there is no material which is bound to the column and that is actually the column regeneration steps. In the column regeneration step, you are going to wash the column with a very, very high ionic strength buffer so that whatever the material is bound to the column should come out. So after the elution of the analyte, the ion exchange chromatography column requires a regeneration step to use the column next time. Column is washed with a salt solution with the ionic strength of 2 molar to remove all non-specifically bound analytes. If you remember, I said right, if you have a bead, the protein may bind to these beads, whereas this is a functional group, either the positive or negative. So your protein is binding to this functional group, whereas the other protein may be binding to the, uh, the matrix. So this, if you wash it with the 2 molar NaCl, you are actually going to remove all these non-specifically bound protein because if you do not do that, the non-specifically bound protein is going to reduce the flow rate and eventually it is going to clog the uh, columns or it will actually going to reduce the surface area of the beads which is available for the protein of your interest to go and bind. Uh, so that will remove the non-specifically bound analytes and also to make all functional group in a ionized form to bind the fresh analytes. So with this we would like to conclude our lecture here and the subsequent lecture we are going to talk about the hydrophobic interaction chromatography. Thank you.